In the meantime, you say in the entire country, there are only two confirmed cases of confirmed Ebola virus. Cases of absolutely, Ebola. absolutely. The rest of them are under surveillance. That would also include those in Enugu, because we understand that some people were placed under surveillance in Enugu. Do you have information on that? So, what, like, like I earlier mentioned, what we will typically do is cast out a wide net, right? We cannot, for one moment, allow anybody that has any symptoms suggestive. I, I, and, and I think the good thing about it is that the media has done a tremendous job of, you know, sharing information about Ebola virus. So that when you're talking to, you know, the layman on the street, he, you know, he has tremendous information about the symptomatology of, uh, of Ebola, Ebola virus disease. So people, you know, come and, you know, they give us calls and say, look, I think uh, I know somebody that has, you know, fever, they have body pains, they are vomiting and di uh, have, having diarrhea. And what we do is we send out a team, you know, immediately to go and investigate, you know. So we rather err on the side of caution than to say, oh, no, this is not, definitely not uh, Ebola, Ebola virus disease. And that is why, you know, uh, we have a situation where we're not having, you know, cases in secondary contacts because we have sort of, you know, uh, widened the uh, the net to make sure that anybody that you know uh, needs to come in for for review is reviewed, or anybody that needs uh, a physician sent to him to review his symptoms is uh, actually actually but, reviewed. Teams, but that's not know. about the the people in Enugu, because you remember that there was a nurse who was said to have. We understand she's been discharged Absolutely. now. Uh, she had travelled to Enugu at some point when she was very ill. And as a result, we understand that initially 21 people were placed under surveillance, but that figure was reduced to six. Do you have any update on the status of those people? No, none of them has, has come up with any symptoms suggestive of uh, uh, Ebola. Definitely on a daily basis, you know, we have people on ground that go to them, uh, take their temperatures, ask for their symptomatology, and, uh, you know, there's nobody that has uh, come up with uh, symptoms that are suggestive. Again, this is just uh, credence to uh, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, work we're doing to ensure that every single possible contact is uh, reached. When you say you send out teams, these teams are made up of what kind of personnel make up these teams? Oh, so, so we have, uh, we have uh, again, like I mentioned earlier, we, we have a, a team that is made up of, you know, government, uh, federal government employees, state government employees, and also uh, partner agencies. So we, we have collaborations from uh, you know, CDC from WHO. So the, these staffers are, are people that work with uh, WHO. For instance, we have uh, national surveillance officers uh, who work with uh, the World Health Organization. Uh, we have um, uh, resident doctors, so medical doctors that are undergoing uh, public health training in the in different universities. So they are the frontline workers that actually go and do these uh, interviews under the supervision of uh, you know world experts in uh, Ebola virus uh, disease. Uh, investigation. What has been a turn up of medical personnel to these centers? Oh, absolutely. It's or been volunteers. No, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's been fantastic. It's been fantastic uh, of recent. What we now have, uh, you know, we have more than, you know, uh, the number of uh, uh, medical doctors and nurses that we require to manage uh, cases. And then some of them are even, you know, like I said, some of them are doing uh, contact tracing. I think uh, for the most part, uh, we've had, um, you know, a lot of doctors volunteering. And uh, what we're now doing is having, we now have a database of, you know, doctors that have applied. But if we don't have maybe a specific uh, shift that we want to put them in, maybe for case management, then we tell them, okay, uh, maybe you can start in two days' time or in three days' time. Because as much as possible, we don't want to overburden, you know, the doctors that are caring uh, for How many personnel patients. do you need? Because if you say that you only have two confirmed cases of mm. Ebola virus disease, uh, are there more people in your care than the, the two people? So, so again, like I said, I, we have to be cautiously optimistic, mm -hmm. you know, um, about this outbreak. We're hopeful that we will not see other cases. But we don't want to be caught, you know, off guard. If at all, for instance, there's another Patrick Sawyer that comes into the, the country. So instead of waiting and start, you know, the process of looking for, for doctors, if anything like that happens, you know, we have now a database of doctors that we can just activate and deploy them to, to, to these uh, clinics, uh, to these hospitals. What I said now, only two patients are in your care. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Tell us only about, um, because I mean, it was gladdening to hear that uh, some people were discharged mm -hmm. uh, afterwards. And so uh, that was how that came about, that it's not a death sentence after all. 
So if you're discharged, does that mean that you can't contract a virus again? No, absolutely. That is exactly what it means. You know, uh, we take great pains um, to take care of these uh, patients that have a Ebola virus disease. And at any point in time, you know, before a patient is discharged, there's a protocol that is followed. This protocol is world standard, it's global standard, because again, these patients are being cared for by people that have cared for patients globally, WHO, CDC, Medicines on Frontier, you know, Doctors Without Borders. Uh, so there is a discharge protocol that we follow. And what that discharge protocol, you know, indicates is, one, that there, is no, there are no symptoms, and there are tests, a laboratory test, is conducted. So these patients, when they were admitted, were positive. And that is why, you know, the Honorable Minister of Health went and kept people abreast of the number of people that were positive. And from that point where they were positive, they were cared for. And then when they now return a negative test, you know, that indicates, you know, that they are good to go, to go home. And when they go back home, they do not, you know, uh, transmit the disease. I understand that, uh, you know, a, a colleague was uh, here yesterday and uh, sort of uh, miscommunicated the, the information that uh, patients that are discharged actually uh, continue to transmit the disease. Uh, again, I also understand that uh, he's a resident, a doctor in training in orthopedics, you know, so clearly this is not his forte. You know, he can talk about bones and fixing bones, but you need a, an infections, infectious disease uh, specialist or a public health specialist that knows about uh, Ebola virus if, if and I'm has evidence here. So that we can clarify this, what he said yesterday had to point to with the fact that this virus, or, is, or according to in their documented evidence, that this virus stays, for instance, in the male semen for like several months, even after he's been cleared, said that the, the patient is now negative. That, these are some of the things he said. So if a man probably gets to meet with his wife, might pass on the virus because it's still in his semen. So again, uh, I think these are statements that have to be uh, made only if you have evidence to prove it. Is it there true? is no evidence. It's absolutely not true. And I, I, I believe that, you know, uh, with further information, uh, he will know. You, will, you do not go to the internet and read everything anybody writes and then you believe it. But the evidence is that this is something that we have discussed in our decision to, dis to discharge a patient. We look at all the protocols, we look at all the safety you know, that uh, safety recommendations that are required. There is no evidence whatsoever in the literature. So I don't know where he's getting that from. You know, it could be speculative. There is no evidence anywhere that anybody has, you know, uh, transmitted the virus to his spouse, you know, through the sperm, you know, through the semen. You know, it's, it's never been documented. So I don't know where he gets his, his facts uh, from. And I think this is a situation where, you know, colleagues have to stick to what is known. Uh, practice is driven by evidence. You know, if there's no evidence, then you cannot, you know, practice uh, just uh, willy-nilly. We have to, you know, follow what is there uh, uh, in, in the literature, and there's nothing in the literature that suggests that it can, it can happen. Okay, and, and, it, and the unfortunate thing is that it might create panic among people when, in actual fact, you know, we need to, uh, to celebrate um, the, the, the lives of people that have given, uh, you know, uh, their lives, you know, in caring for uh, Ebola patients. And therefore, those people that have gone through this ordeal and have actually survived it, you know, then we need to, you know, send our hearts out to them and encourage, you know, their families and uh, community members to give them the kind of support that they require, you know, and not, you know, send out messages that are completely uh, false. But uh, uh, is it true that there are five strains uh, of this EVD? Well, based on uh, the evidence that's available, yes. Okay, because I've heard doctors say, yes, there are five strains. And so if you come down with one, it means that, uh, who knows, you have to continue protecting yourself because there's a possibility that you could come down with one of those other four. You're absolutely right. But <laughs> again, you me. also have to ask yourself, you know, what are the chances? You know, it's like lightning striking twice you know in the same place yeah. it's one of the